The truly passionate can make their thoughts infectious, inspiring others to love their ideas even if they don't know who came up with them. This is true of Satoshi Tajiri, a private man who is relatively unknown compared to other superstar developers. Despite this, Tajiri's excitement to share his love of games kickstarted a multi-billion dollar series. This is how a kid wandering the rural countryside of Japan looking for bugs became the creator of the most popular multimedia franchise in history. This is Satoshi Tajiri. Satoshi Tajiri was born in Machida, a suburban part of Tokyo, on August 28, 1965. His father sold Nissan cars, while his mother stayed at home raising Tajiri and his younger sister. Tajiri was a curious child who loved to explore the forests around where he lived. There, he found streams and abandoned air raid shelters, where he discovered new insects and animals. Tajiri was an insect fanatic, and wanted to be an entomologist. He'd collect bugs so much that his friends called him the Bug Professor. He'd even leave big rocks near trees and come back after after some time to see what new bugs had made their home under the stone. From a young age, Tajiri was interested in researching and showing his findings to classmates, so much so that one of his teachers blocked out time for him to present his findings to the class. Tajiri also began making newsletters for his classmates during his later years in elementary school. As time went on, his interest in collecting small creatures evolved past bugs, and he began catching and raising other animals like frogs and crawfish. Unfortunately, Tajiri would find his hobby unsustainable as Tokyo began to modernize. The rivers Tajiri played in when he was younger were filled in as several bridges and dams were built. A great deal of land in Tokyo was also being paved over, further blocking access to the nature he used to explore. Much of the local wildlife was driven away as the city developed, but Tajiri would find a new hobby to fill the void left behind. While he was in middle school, an arcade opened near Tajiri's home, where he was introduced to video games. Like many other Japanese people during this time, Tajiri and his friends took a particular liking to Space Invaders. He found he had a particular knack for playing video games, claiming many of the top scores at the local arcade. Tajiri began to garner a reputation for being able to play games for a long time on very little pocket change, earning him the nickname The Storm of the Arcade. Much of Tajiri's desire to study and share information crossed over into gaming, and he began studying how the games worked. Feeling that others might want to use his knowledge to improve their own scores, Tajiri began writing tips and strategy guides for various titles. He played games so often during this time that one arcade just gave him a Space Invaders cabinet. Tajiri's interest in games grew beyond just playing them and into the early stages of game development. As a young child, he entered a contest held by Universal Entertainment with an idea called the Midnight Crows. Tajiri's vision for the title started with a simple black screen with crows hidden in the darkness. Occasionally, the crows would open their eyes, allowing the players to locate and shoot at them. Tajiri's idea was a hit and was recognized by Universal's contest. In junior high school, he dreamed of creating a sequel to Space Invaders, developing the idea into a concept called Spring Strangers. Tajiri submitted his idea to a contest held by Sega, and ended up winning the grand prize. Sega invited the young Tajiri to their headquarters to accept the award, the first time the burgeoning developer would be welcomed at a game company. This event would have a huge impact on the young Tajiri. However, this passion for video games took its toll on Tajiri's schoolwork, as he often skipped class to go to the arcade and play new games. He almost didn't graduate high school and had no aspirations of attending university, something seen as a requirement in Japanese culture to have a respectable career. Despite giving half the money he'd won from Sega's contest to his parents, they felt that their son was becoming a delinquent because of this hobby. His father knew he was interested in electronics, as Tajiri had saved to buy a PC-8000 so he could learn how to code games. Because of this, Tajiri's father tried to get him a job as an electric utility repair person at the Tokyo Electric Power Company, though Tajiri refused the offer. He did eventually complete a two-year major in electronics and computer science at the Tokyo National College of Technology. In the early 1980s, Tajiri noticed there was little multimedia about video games despite the popularity of titles like Donkey Kong and Space Invaders, and he decided that he could use his love of collecting and distributing information to his advantage. In 1982, Tajiri published the first issue of a fanzine he called Game Freak, featuring strategy guides on completing games, articles about new arcade releases, lists of easter eggs to find, and tips on how to get the highest scores possible. Every issue was handwritten and photocopied, then stapled together by Tajiri. The first cover of Game Freak featured Dig Dug, which Tajiri drew himself. 
However, Tajiri had very little artistic talent, and did his best to draw the pixels on graph paper using the game as reference. Game Freak was first sold at local bookstores for 200 yen per issue, which is roughly $2.35 in today's money. Though this seemed like a somewhat high price for an unofficial handwritten photocopied magazine, Tajiri was confident it could be successful. Tajiri believed there was a genuine interest in that content, and his instincts were spot on. Game Freak quickly found modest success, and was soon distributed by mail order. Demand was so high that Tajiri enlisted his mother and sister to help stuff envelopes for Game Freak orders received from all over Japan. In 1983, Namco released the arcade shoot-'em-up Xevious, which caught the attention of Tajiri. He quickly became hooked on the title and decided to make an issue of Game Freak dedicated to the game. This special issue ended up being the most successful Game Freak to date, selling more than 10,000 copies. At just age 18, Tajiri's small startup was so successful he had to shift away from handwriting to typing them up, and he began collaborating with contributors. The Xevious issue of Game Freak also opened up new opportunities for Tajiri. Namco hired a player who achieved 10 million points in Xevious to create an official guidebook for the title, but the player wasn't able to because they were busy with school exams. Instead, the player contacted Tajiri and invited him to work on the project. With Tajiri's aid, the guide became successful, doubling expectations and selling 15,000 copies. Another notable collaborator brought in by the success of Game Freak was an artist named Ken Sugimori. Like Tajiri, Sugimori had no interest in attending university and wanted to focus on becoming an illustrator. This decision angered Sugimori's family, who kicked him out for his artistic ambition. At some point, Sugimori saw a Game Freak in a doujinshi shop and reached out, offering to draw for the magazine. He moved to live closer to Tajiri, beginning a long-lasting friendship that would one day define the artistic direction of Game Freak's most popular creation. As Game Freak continued to grow in popularity and Tajiri played more games, it became increasingly obvious to him which games were good and which were bad. To help fix this perceived issue, Tajiri decided that Game Freak should shift from just talking about video games and into full development. In the latter half of 1983, Nintendo released the Famicom in Japan, and Tajiri was determined to make games for the device. He studied the Famicom's programming language, Family Basic, and bought the development hardware necessary to enter production. At one point, he even took a Famicom apart to study how it worked. However, Tajiri and Game Freak quickly ran into an issue. In order to release games for the Famicom, they needed a contract with Nintendo. To solve this problem, Game Freak decided to pitch their ideas to companies who were already licensed partners of Nintendo instead of seeking a direct contract themselves. Tajiri began brainstorming ideas, and was heavily influenced by Namco's game design principles. He'd noticed that each of Namco's games were built upon a verb. Dig Dug was about digging, while Pac-Man was about eating. Tajiri searched for his own verb for Game Freak's first title, and eventually landed on flipping, which would become the basis for Quinty. This title saw players flipping over tiles on a board, using powers found underneath to push enemies to the walls of the game board. Tajiri and Game Freak pitched Quinty to Namco, who picked it up and published it for the Famicom. It was later localized for Western audiences as Mendel Palace, with a fantasy aesthetic replacing Sugimori's chibi art. Worldwide, Quinty would sell over 200,000 copies, giving Game Freak enough resources to officially establish themselves as a company on April 26, 1989. Interestingly, the biggest inspiration for Tajiri and the idea that would define the next step of his career came from an unexpected place. Frustration. After Dragon Quest II's release in 1987, both Tajiri and Sugimori played the RPG and frequently compared their progress. During his playthrough, Sugimori managed to get two Madcaps, a rare item that dropped randomly during encounters. This annoyed Tajiri as he'd yet to have a single Madcap drop. In 1989, Nintendo released the Game Boy handheld console, which had the capability to connect with other Game Boys via a link cable peripheral for competitive multiplayer. However, after seeing the link cable, Tajiri realized that players would be able to work cooperatively as well, potentially trading items such as the Madcap to a friend who lacked their own, or working together to fight bosses. Additionally, after seeing Final Fantasy Legend release on the Game Boy, Tajiri realized that not every game on the system had to be a fast-paced action game. Thinking back to Namco's verb-based game design principles, Tajiri began brainstorming a game centered on exchanging, imagining small creatures crawling back and forth between Game Boys along the link cable. Tajiri dreamed up an idea revolving around the collection, trading, and battling of capsule monsters. Game Freak pitched this idea to Nintendo, who eventually picked it up and agreed to publish it. The pitch particularly caught the attention of Shigeru Miyamoto, who served as a mentor for Tajiri as the idea gestated. 
However, the Capsule Monsters game ended up taking six years to make, an extraordinarily long development cycle at the time, and Game Freak would need to work on several smaller projects to fund the studio. The first of these games was Smart Ball, a title written, designed, and directed by Tajiri. The game was published by Sony for the SNES, commissioned to show the Super Nintendo sound trip which Sony contributed to. As a platformer that sees players take control of a character named Jerry Bean, Smart Ball was a modest success that didn't stand out amongst the early titles of the SNES. Nevertheless, a sequel was planned at one point, but cancelled after Nintendo and Sony had a falling out over contract disputes for a CD-based SNES add-on which ultimately became the PlayStation. Afterwards, Tajiri showed his capsule monster idea to mother creator Shigesano Atoy, though Atoy felt that Game Freak still needed more experience before taking on such a big idea. Atoy referred Tajiri to Game Boy creator Gunpei Yokoi, who was looking for a team to make a Yoshi game for the handheld. The title had a strict six-month deadline, and forced both Tajiri and Game Freak to learn a great deal about game development quickly. Under Tajiri's direction, Yoshi was completed on time with a somewhat mixed reception, though it impressed Nintendo enough to lend Game Freak the Mario IP. Tajiri then directed the Japan-exclusive puzzle game Mario and Wario, which saw players use the SNES mouse to guide Mario through levels. In 1995, despite their close relationship with Nintendo, Tajiri and Sugimori co-directed an action platformer titled Pulseman for the publisher's main rival, Sega. Another modest success, a few of Pulseman's ideas would live on as attacks in future Game Freak titles. Tajiri compared working as contractors on games like this to doing homework, just wanting to get them done as quickly as possible to the best of their ability so they could work on projects they were passionate about. During this period, Tajiri also put his experience in writing magazines to work, briefly working as a freelancer for various publications like Famicom Hishoban, Family Computer Magazine, Famitsu, and Playboy Weekly, though this publication had no relation to the American Adult Magazine. Despite these numerous contracts, development on Tajiri's Capsule Monster's idea was sluggish and nearly bankrupted Game Freak. Tajiri frequently lacked the funds to pay his employees, and five staff members quit as a result. Tajiri never paid himself during this time and had to live off his parents' income to survive. However, Game Freak didn't give up on the idea, and were eventually able to complete development with the support of Nintendo and extra investments from Ape Incorporated, now known as Creatures Incorporated. Tajiri often stayed awake for more than 24 hours to help come up with ideas for the game, before sleeping another 12 and starting the process over. The concepts of Capsule Monsters evolved quite a bit since Tajiri first conceived of the game. The idea of collecting, battling, and trading monsters remained, but Tajiri also wanted to include an entire world for players to explore, inspired by his childhood experiences in rural Tokyo. So much of Tajiri was in the title that he decided the default name of the main protagonist should be Satoshi. Tajiri has even gone as far as to call the player character him when he was a kid. Shigeru was chosen as the default name for the player's rival, honoring the advice and guidance Tajiri was given by Shigeru Miyamoto. Tajiri also insisted the monsters faint after losing a battle instead of dying, because he thought there was already enough violence in the world and didn't want kids to associate losing a game with death. Upon hearing the concept of trading and battling across consoles, Miyamoto suggested that multiple versions of the game be released with different monsters on each, to encourage trading between players, a tradition that every entry in the series would follow. Game Freak ran into trademark issues with the name Capsule Monsters, trying alternatives like Capumon before settling on Pocket Monsters. This name was eventually shortened further when it was localized for the West, becoming Pokemon. Development on Pokemon Red and Green was finally completed after six years, with the games releasing in Japan on February 27, 1996. However, Nintendo and Game Freak did not have high expectations for them. The Game Boy was very far into its lifespan, and with the release of the Nintendo 64, both companies felt that gamers had moved on from the handheld. Several publications didn't cover the release of Red and Green for similar reasons, and Tajiri had even worried that the general lack of interest in the titles would lead Nintendo to reject them. However, they hadn't taken into account how many young Japanese children were still playing the Game Boy because it was cheaper than new hardware. Over the next few months, sales of Pokemon Red and Green never dropped off, and many gamers bought both versions so they could capture every Pokemon on their own. Surprised by the consistent sales, Tajiri experimented with ways to keep interest in the games alive. Nintendo and Game Freak partnered with the publishing company Shogagukan, who made a manga adaptation of the series. Media Factory was then commissioned to create the first version of the Pokemon trading card game in October of 1996, with some promotional cards being given away with issues of the manga. 
After development was completed on red and green, but before they were sent to be printed on cartridges, programmer Shigeki Morimoto secretly added a final Pokémon as a prank. Morimoto only ever intended for this Pokémon, the legendary Mew, to be obtainable by Game Freak's staff. Rumors of this 151st Pokémon began to spread, and Tajiri decided to capitalize on them. In Koro Koro magazine, Tajiri confirmed the existence of Mew and distributed playing cards featuring the Pokémon. Interest in the Pokémon spiked, and Game Freak quickly organized a contest to distribute 151 Mews to lucky winners. Tajiri believes the secrecy and inability to capture Mew through traditional means created positive word of mouth and helped to virally market these early Pokémon games. By the end of 1997, Pokémon Red and Green had sold more than 4.6 million copies in Japan alone. The trading card game was a hit, an anime adaptation began airing, and a third, updated blue version had also been released. Despite fears that Western audiences wouldn't find the series as compelling, localized versions of Pokémon Red and Blue were released in 1998, with the anime and trading card game following closely afterwards. The series was equally successful in the West, with many outlets dubbing the phenomenon Pokémania. The series became so popular that several schools had to ban the trading cards because they were distracting students and causing fights. After the release of Red, Green, and Blue, Tajiri directed Pokémon Yellow, another version of the original title that took more cues from the anime adaptation. From there, he contributed designs to the action RPG tactics game Bushi Seriyuden, released exclusively in Japan for the Super Famicom. However, the continued success of Pokémon drew Tajiri back to the franchise, and he once again took the director's chair for a pair of full-fledged sequels, Pokémon Gold and Silver. Upon their release in 1999, they continued the enormous success of the Pokémon franchise, going on to sell more than 23 million units to date. However, Pokémon Gold and Silver would be the final game Satoshi Tajiri directed himself, instead stepping up into a more managerial role at Game Freak. Tajiri is credited as an executive director for the third-generation Pokémon games, Ruby and Sapphire, with series composer Junichi Matsuda taking on the director's chair. A similar dynamic between Tajiri and Matsuda continued on Pokémon Fire Red and Leaf Green, remakes of Tajiri's original games for the Game Boy Advance. Tajiri also served as scenario writer for the remakes, and approved all of the game's text himself. After Fire Red and Leaf Green, Tajiri fully stepped away from the day-to-day -day development of the games, though he has been credited as an executive producer on every title Game Freak has developed since, whether they were related to Pokémon or not. Since the early 2000s, Tajiri has stepped away from life in the public eye. He's rarely given interviews, instead focusing on his work at Game Freak. That said, a manga based on his life was released in 2018. Tajiri's passion for sharing information about what he loves and his desire to use that to develop good games literally changed several industries. Since Red and Green released on the Game Boy, Pokémon has become the highest-grossing multimedia franchise in history, with an estimated $95 billion of total revenue across its games, merchandise, animation, and even a Hollywood feature film. All of this from a kid who liked bugs, stapling together his self-published game magazine. Did you also know the character Red was originally going to have a much larger role in Pokémon Gold and Silver, or that Hideo Kojima only made Metal Gear 2 after a chance encounter on a train? For more facts, check out our videos on Pokémon's Red and Hideo Kojima.